Welcome to Inside Auto Podcast, where we feature everyone and anyone you'd want to talk to in and out of the automotive industry. Ilana Shabtai here, host of Inside Auto Podcast, where we interview top dealers, GMs, marketers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders in and out of the automotive industry. Before we introduce today's guest, this episode is sponsored by FullPath.com. FullPath is automotive's leading customer data and experience platform, CDXP. FullPath enables dealers to turn their first-party data into lifelong customers by unifying siloed data sources and leveraging that data to create exceptional, hyper-personalized customer experiences. To learn more, visit FullPath.com. Today, we're welcoming Russ Richardson. Russ, how are you? Good. How are you doing today? Good. I'm so excited to have Russ on the on the call today. First of all, I have never met Russ before, so I get to learn all about the amazing things he's doing. Um, Russ lives right outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and sells Lincolns at Beyondy Lincoln. He provides free, valuable content on all Lincoln products and makes really funny car sales skits, so we'll talk about that. Uh, and he's killing it on social media. And we're here today to talk about this approach because I think um, not enough people are taking advantage. Not enough people, unfortunately, are as creative as you are. So there's also that. But we're excited to have you on. Before we talk about, you know, the niche that you're kind of in and and what you've created for yourself, tell me a little bit about how you got into automotive. Yeah, absolutely. So I was originally washing cars at the same dealership I work at now. At around 15 years old, the general manager's son, good friend of mine, just kind of hooked me up with the job, just started cleaning cars. And then my senior year of high school, we had what was called a work release program. So basically the principal sat down all the juniors going to be into our senior year. And he said, hey, I want to try something out this year. If you guys get a legitimate job, you know, you can't be flipping patties. He's got to be a real job. Or if you're going to go to take college classes, I will let you only come to school first through fourth period. You can skip periods five through eight. So basically coming to school for a half day. And I was never much of a scholar. So I was like, I got to figure that out. So I had approached the manager about maybe just me answering phones or just something in the dealership. Basically, the time I just wanted to leave school. And he was like, you know what? You should sell cars. You'd be pretty good at it. Um, You talk good. You, you, You present yourself well. Why don't you come sell cars? So I started selling cars in high school. I would leave school after fourth period, go straight to the dealership and sell cars. And I ended up, you know, just being pretty good at it. And I just... I've been doing it at that location, that dealership ever since. I'm 24 now. I started at 18, so a little over six years in the business. That's incredible. I, I mean, I think, I think that's what I also just love about the automotive industry so much is that like you want to find like your own, you know, figure out how to use your passion and use your skills. It's just the best place for for that. So I'm 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 happy you shared that with us. And so it's been six years. You've probably seen the industry change a lot in the past six years. Uh, including just like the influence of social media. Tell us a little bit about how you started with your social media, what's been working. Um, also, I'd love to know what, what sort of like influences the the TikToks that you do put out. So I have definitely seen the car industry change a ton, you know, starting pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic, you know, with the inflammation of buying cars online, which a lot of viewers have moved to, are more flexible to give numbers and payments over the phone via email work. When I first started, not so much at my dealership, we've always kind of been a little bit more progressive, but I just remember the industry and all like places wouldn't even quote your numbers over the phone. Oh, you got to come in. My manager. Yeah. Ink. Yeah. Yeah. Had to be an ink. Had to be sitting in front of me. You want the best deal. Get down here now where it's like you're putting your best price online, praising trades um, over the phone, sight unseen, because you got to keep up with the competition, which Carvana definitely changed that industry. Uh, The social media thing started. When I realized being at a Lincoln dealership, you know, I get to see these cars before 99% of people do. And I get a little bit more time with them than even the guys who might get to them before me. They might get 20 minutes with the car, 30 minutes. It's at the auto show. So when these cars were coming off the truck, I think my first real big video I made on YouTube at probably 18, 19 years old was the new Lincoln Aviator, which was a highly anticipated vehicle. And that video got a couple hundred thousand views. And then I did a special edition Continental. That video got hundreds of thousands of views. But being a Lincoln dealer, we only sell four cars right now. So like reviewing the car content kind of dried up pretty quick. Yeah. And I, I, I actually went through a point where I just wasn't even making any content. But being in car sales, 
you know, a lot of people don't understand. Even if you sold two cars every day, which most guys don't do that. I'm not claiming to do that either. You still have some downtime. If you're there for eight hours, nine hours a day, and like I said, you say you did sell two cars a day. That takes four or five hours. So there is hours upon hours at a car dealership where you could either do follow up, you know, do nothing like a lot of car salesmen guys do. Right. For me, I like making content. And that's kind of where I shifted into the, you know, car sales advice for other car salesmen, car buying advice for people buying cars. And then my more popular and most famous videos that seem to get the most traction are where I make fun of the car industry via yeah. for, be a Karen customer, as I call it. You know, I'm sure everyone knows what Karen means by now. Or yeah. being like a sleazy car salesman. You just kind of poke and fun at both sides. To answer your question, 99% of my videos are literally someone was in my dealership very recently acting that way and they leave. And whether it was my experience with them or now, I've yeah. not big where like, you know, the dealership people know I make the videos like, well, like, Russ, 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 I just had this customer listen to what they did. You got to make a video about them. And that it- is, that's honestly hysterical. And thanks for sharing that with us. Um, do you, do you feel like you, you can actually um, attribute social media to some of your car sales? Yes, absolutely. Not only with like, it's almost in its own form, a way of follow up. You know, so not only with like my previous customers, or maybe I haven't done the best job of calling like I should, you know, follow up is definitely not a salesman's best habit. You know, we want, we're always living in the now, but it always keeps me fresh in front of customers. I've seen people at the gym that I sold a car to four years ago, forgot they even existed. They bumped into me, did a lot of your videos. Matter of fact, this, this, and this, I'm looking for a car, come down, buy a car. So, I mean, not only with staying in front of the people I already, that already know, like, and trust me, I've definitely made a decent bit of sales. Um, for people who have just no clue who I am or I don't know who they are, they've kind of messaged me directly or come into the dealership and asked to see Russ Flips Whips. That's, that's, that's what I wanted to know. That's really cool. Now, it also, maybe, does it make follow-up easier because you could just, like, send a content instead of being like, hey, follow up, do you want to buy the car? Or Absolutely. You, like, you, just, you still have to be really proactive to do that. And as I mentioned... I get the I get the vehicle inventory in first before a lot of people see them. And then sometimes, well not sometimes, always the manufacturer will like just for like a day bring by like a presentation model. Like, hey, here's the new navigator. It's not ready yet, probably about three, four months out till they hit your lot, but we wanted you, the salesman, to see it so you can tell your customers about it. I'm pretty tight with the guy who brings that car. He always lets me take it out back, make an hour long video. That's I chop it up, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. So when a customer asks about it, I'll send them the link to my TikTok or my Instagram. Like, oh, yeah, you want to see what the navigator looks like? Here you go. It's really smart. That's really smart. Do you, are you trying, do you think other people in the dealership are, are going to kind of follow your lead here or, um, or, or even just like mooch off of you? Like they could take your content and then be like, hey, this is our dealership. Send it. You know, it's, it's more the, it's more the mooch, you know, and just, yeah, that- a video. My customer was asking about it. Um. That's funny. I'm probably the only social media guy at my dealership. Um, just not for everyone. I work with some older people. Not that they're against it. Just like I'm not getting on camera, you know, yeah. or I get on camera like twice a day. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing an amazing job. Now, when it comes to, um, I mean, we're talking a lot about the good, which is great. What's what's like the, the challenging part of using social media um, just to like help build your personal brand? What's been What's been like a little bit harder? Either for I've you offended or- some people. You know, I, I get it. If you if you watch my videos on TikTok, I definitely push the line, and I might have crossed it once or twice. And you know, it happens. You Considering know, that I looked at your videos all day. What does your manager think about the videos? They love them. They think they're hilarious, right. and they're the ones whispered in my ears half the time. Yeah. Uh, I've made one or two where they might have advised me to take it down, which I yeah. may or may not have. I won't say what videos. But, uh, <laughs> I've actually had, you know, it's funny. One of our competitor dealers, I won't name names, reached out to the owner of my dealership. He's old. He's not on social media. Yeah. And he, he presented it to my owner, who had never seen any of my videos, just heard. He goes, You're, this kid's an embarrassment to your dealership. You should see what he's posting. So my owner, like, approached me. He's like, the owner of the dealership, hey, dude, like, so-and-so. Now, he's our competitor, so I'm not going to take his, you know, take 
show me your videos. And I showed him like 20 of them. And he was like peeing himself laughing. He was like, he really <laughs> thinks this is offensive? Because these are hilarious. So most and you're like, nope, he's just really jealous because I'm driving a ton of traffic to our dealership. And and that's kind of what we agreed upon. It was, like I said, I'm not going to name names. I'm not getting into that game, but a local competitor of ours kind of tried bringing the hammer down on me. And it, it actually, this is probably, at this time, I might have only had 20,000 followers on TikTok. I think now, you know, I might be at 75,000. It kind of sparked a little fire in me and I doubled down. You know, I started... Just to make it even more content. Push this way like five, six months ago, and I've tripled my following, and a lot of my views have gone up since. So I kind of thank the guy for coming down on me because, it, for lack of a better word, pissed me off. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'm double. Do that. That's awesome. And then what? So the ch- so you mentioned that the challenging part is obviously that you you might offend some people and just navigating that. What about on the, like the practical or technical side? Like um, a video doesn't come out the way you want it to. Do you ever just like do it? You have a good or you think you have a great idea? You. You, you record the video, and then when you actually see it, you're just like, eh, never mind, nix the whole thing, which, by the way, it's totally fine because, you know, you want to keep valuable content. I'm just wondering, like, what that process is like for you. I pretty much post everything I record. There, it's funny, though, the, the how you mentioned it, because probably my, I think my most famous video, uh, second most famous, like maybe like two or three million views, me and my brother recorded. My brother works with me in my dealership, my younger brother. He pretty much every video you see and we both hated it we're like this is stupid and i was like i'm gonna post it anyway see whatever and i posted it and it was like well people must not so I, that video was kind of like a learning lesson don't use my sense of humor because the, the videos we make where i'm crying laughing watch it and i'll watch it before i post it i'll watch it over and i'm just like this is hilarious it'll get no views and i'm like okay so yeah I sense of humor is I different than the general population uh, that's actually really good advice like diversify the content. Don't go by what you might think is funny because who knows what someone else is going to think is funny. I found the more relatable it is. Yeah. And that's kind of why, you know, pretending to be like a bad car salesman because everyone's bought a car. Yeah. Not everyone sold cars, but everyone's bought a car. So when I try to make videos through the lens of a consumer, that tends to hit home a little harder. Like I said, everyone's bought cars. Not everyone's been in my shoes of selling the car. So they'll still get some good news. But when I can do anything that, the average nine out of 10 people have probably been in a car dealership and bought a car and dealt with someone who was annoying or in a weird situation. Those are the ones that seem to take off the best. Yeah, that's always entertaining also because just the stigma of car dealerships. And I think actually, even though you're you're actively putting it out there and making fun of it, actually, it breaks down the stigma, which is really nice. So like, yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about that actually. Not, and that's your whole point of right. videos. Is, well, if you can recognize what is wrong with the orships? You it would kind of break down that barrier of like, well, this guy gets it. So I'm assuming he's not gonna treat me like that because he's on here recognizing it and he's probably not like that, you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you if you think about like yourself in the next five, ten years, is there um something else that you hope to do with content and or social media? Do you want to make it more of like a a a job for yourself, a career for yourself, or do you like that it's sort of supporting what you're doing now, which is selling cars, which you also mentioned a few times that you really love doing and that you're great at. So what what's your kind of hope for yourself for the next five to 10 years? Um, You know, I, I go back and forth on this a lot and I'm definitely a live in the now person, but I do plan for the future. I, c- I would not be surprised if in five, 10 years from now, my, my page was kind of a little bit more focused, not only on car sales, maybe in more of an ownership role, but also kind of flip it into real estate, which I do act very actively on the side. I don't talk about it a whole lot on the page yet. But, you know, if you see some of the bigger content creators out there, like the Grant Cardones and, you know, just yeah. guys like him, a lot of them started in some sales or something. And then it became more personalized about them and what they're just their daily lives, you know, just show what they do, how they do it, how to get, how to make money. So uh, I think I'll always be in the car business, though, one way or another. Oh, okay. that's that's that's. Great. And then when you said, what what do you mean by real estate? Like you do that a little bit on the side, you dabble in it, you're interested in it. Yeah. So like long-term rentals, acquiring properties, flipping properties, creative ways to buy properties. I bought properties in ways that most people aren't even aware of that it's even possible of doing, just seller financing, off-market deals, things like that. But, you know, my, it's not really my niche to talk about right now, but when that time yeah. comes, I'll have a lot of information to share on it. That's cool. All right. We'll look out for that. 
Um, anything else you want to share with us before we sign off here? This was just eye opening for me. And I hope that a lot of people listening here will also just understand the impact of content and what you can do with like creativity and just like be having fun and making fun of yourself a little bit. Like, I feel like we, we need to do that a little bit more often, especially in 2023. So I appreciate you bringing that energy, but is there anything that you want to, to tell us before we sign off? Yeah, I guess my last thing would be, you know, a lot of people go back and forth on if dealership should even exist, if we should go to a direct sales model. And I, I say to people, you know, there are good dealerships and bad dealerships. Spend your money at the good dealerships and you'll be taken care of and the bad dealerships will go out of business. Uh, but yeah. if you think dealerships are greedy, wait do you see how greedy big corporations are. They have, a, they have a bad track record of being greedy. So any type of manufacturer that wants to go to a direct sales model it's so they could just profit themselves more, it's not in the benefit of the consumer. And corporations have very, very bad customer service. So I think in the future here, you're going to have big conglomerate dealers, and then you're going to have standalone dealers like the one I work at that specialize in customer service. And that's going to be the difference between just being treated like a number and being treated like a friend and family. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. Thanks for sharing that. And it's a good way to sign up here. A little bit of hope for the industry, which we always like here on Inside Auto Podcast. So thank you so much, Russ, for joining and for sharing a little bit of what you've been up to. My pleasure. I, I hope you're going to go to sleep and get some rest in now. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Inside Auto Podcast. Check out our other episodes with top entrepreneurs and industry leaders.